Hi, everybody. Welcome to the fourth week of Lent. Today, we're jumping into 1 Corinthians chapters 10 through 13. Therefore, brothers and sisters, flee the worship of idols. Yeah, that's how our readings begin this week. And wow, that's a pretty clear and forceful call, isn't it? Paul is talking about matters related to worship. Uh, namely the worship of idols. And you'll remember that Paul is writing to uh, the church of Corinth, writing his rich Corinthian letter, letter to these Christian communities that are deeply compromised and conflicted because they are immature in their faith. They have not gone very far in integrating the way of Jesus into their everyday lives. More often than not, they resemble their pagan neighbors more than Christians in how they think, in how they feel, in how they act. And the point is clear to them then and clear to us now in our own time as well. Um, we have to be careful about that, about the pervasive nature of paganism in the modern world, just like in the ancient world, working its way through all the institutions of society, all the communication platform in the public square. Um, it's very dominant. And as Christians, we have to guard ourselves, our hearts and minds. We have to be savvy in how we discern um, what is right and what is wrong, what honors Christ, and what participates in dominant pagan ways that, that surround us. So Paul here in this later section in the book of 1 Corinthians wants to focus on issues that he's been hearing about in how they do worship. And he starts with idolatry, which is rife in that city. It was built into everything um, to the extent that even meat sold in the marketplace well, it started out not in some butcher's block, but as a sacrifice at some pagan temple in the city. Temples acted as major food supply uh, centers because of all the food that was brought in as sacrifices. It went from there to restaurants. It went to marketplaces. And oftentimes on festival times, those temples were restaurants themselves, great gathering places on many feasts of the, of the week, of the year, of the month, when pagans would gather to worship uh, the, 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 the gods that were worshipped there um, with large amounts of sacrifices. And so this became an issue for those congregations of Jesus followers, many of whom were Jews who would never, never, ever consider eating such meat, and many of whom were Gentiles who routinely ate of it and out of custom still participated in those pagan rites. So you have these, these groups gathering together to worship Jesus, and you got a lot of problems abounding. And so Paul is trying to tie these two groups together around the shared communion of in the, with the cup and the loaf, with the blood and body of Christ. And he had to walk a very thin line between the freedom that we share in Christ and the conscientious restrictions that many Christians felt about all the pagan stuff. So in chapter 10, he says, do it all for the glory of God. And in consideration of your brothers and sisters in Christ. So it's another way of saying, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. See how that works? Um, it's, it's a tough balance that we in every age have to work out, sometimes with great care in our life as Christians in community. Now, addressing after addressing customs regarding head coverings in chapter 11, Paul jumps into abuses that he's heard about in their practice of communion. Now we're into chapter 12, which he addressed, which we addressed on Ash Wednesday in the exhortation. Remember those uh, Paul's exhortation there that we need to prepare to receive the Holy Eucharist. We have to judge ourselves lest we be judged so that we receive the body and blood of Christ in a manner worthy of the Lord. And then next in chapters 
12 and 13, he gets into the gifts of the Holy Spirit, or what he calls in Greek, the pneumaticon. He describes these spiritual gifts as manifestations of the Holy Spirit who resides in each of us, uh, active in the lives of individual believers. Uh, it's, it's abilities. It's a calling for ministry. It's empowering for service, which combined together as everybody is doing their job, using their spiritual gift to build up the body of Christ, to extend the ministry of Jesus out into the world, into the surrounding uh, community there in Corinth or here in the Loudoun Valley. He describes how there are many different gifts from the Holy Spirit who are given to many different kinds of individuals in the body of Christ, in the church. Um, but they are all, all this diverse gifts, all these diverse people, they are all from one source, one spirit, one Lord, one Father, and they are all for one purpose, which is building up the church and extending its ministry in the world. So just as God is one and many, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, so the gifts, so are all the gifts of the Spirit. They're all from one Spirit. They're all given to many individuals in the church. So and so is the body of Christ. It is diverse with the many, many members many limbs and organs, but it is one body uh, in Christ, the church. The one, the many, held in dynamic balance and tension, working itself out in the life of the community and the many individuals that compose it. I love how Paul balances the one and the many there, which in philosophy is one of the great questions. It's one of the great um, pendulum swings like in current uh, social philosophy in the West since the Enlightenment. You see it in politics, the, uh, the, the pu push and pull between individualism on the one hand and collectivism on the other. Um, Paul manages in the church to hold these uh, together in dynamic tension and balance not pendulum swinging from one side to the other. Now, Paul invests all that time in chapters 12 and 13 into the gifts of the Spirit because he wants to make sure that those Corinthians would stop favoring one gift above the others or one group of believers above the others or one leader over the others, all right? Each is vitally important to the whole. And therefore, Paul calls us to give equal honor and respect to each gift of the Holy Spirit, each person in the body of Christ that is trying to exercise that gift. And in chapter 13, Paul concludes by saying that love is the greatest gift of all that must be exercised by all and for all. And of course, you know, 1 Corinthians 13 is so beautiful in how he describes it. And the point I'd like to emphasize about all this, because division and rivalry uh, uh, is not a big issue at St. Peter's, what I would like to emphasize from this is how vitally important each person's spiritual gifts are to the life of St. Peter's, and how vitally important each of your efforts is to exercise your gift for ministry, to build up the life of St. Peter's, and to extend our reach into the world. If you are sitting on the pew, on the sidelines, watching other people using their gifts for ministry to lead and to serve, to make the ministry of St. Peter's happen, well, then our congregation is impoverished by your lack of participation. You, you ever heard of the 80-20 rule? <clears throat> that 20% of the people do 80% of the work? What Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 is that is not the way it should be in the body of Christ. So if you're sitting on the sidelines out on your nicely padded pew, well, it's time to get up and get to work. God bless you all, and I look forward to seeing you on Sunday.